Anton Hellman here from EM Cases. Now, before we get into the wild world of ocular trauma recorded live at the 2018 EM Cases course in Toronto, I thought I'd give you a little taste of what the participants and faculty learned at the conference in sort of a potpourri of audio bites. Thanks so much to Dr. Barb Tatum and Michelle Yi for conducting these interviews at the course. I learned about how it is safe and pretty simple to do a IND of the peritonsillar abscess in the emergency department and some little pearls that you can use such as using a safety guard for a scalpel blade and for a needle driver to prevent going into the carotid artery uh, when you're doing the procedure. You don't necessarily need to refer them to ENT. You can do this in the eMERGE and have them out the door within an hour. The external rotation of the ankle is like chest pain going to the back. You can't miss it. I am Gotham Walia. I am a general practitioner working in the emergency department at Uxbridge Cottage Hospital in Uxbridge. One of the take-home points that I took away from today's great session was about the rise of thrombectomy in uh, stroke. So... I work at a site where we uh, refer out to our strokes to a regional stroke center and been guided previously that uh, patients outside of the four to five hour window really don't benefit from referral to a stroke center. So being able to review some of the latest studies that have come out about a month ago have been quite helpful uh, and will also be helpful for me when I'm talking to consultants, the stroke uh, physician on the other line in terms of uh, trying to get a patient to the appropriate disposition. So that's a big take home point for me today. I think definitely more and more of us are moving away from antibiotics in adult patients with culture proven strep pharyngitis. Uh, These days in developed countries, in urban centers particularly, there's extremely, extremely low risk of getting rheumatic fever. Uh, So the number needed to treat for rheumatic rheumatic fever is is crazy high. So definitely, you know, one in uh, the hundreds of thousands, if not one in a million, uh, compared to the fairly high incidence of uh, number needed to harm, particularly with anaphylaxis, uh, so severe life-threatening anaphylaxis, as well as antibiotic-associated diarrhea, including C. difficile. Um, So I think the, you know, the 6 to 16 hours or basically less than a day of symptom improvement may not be worth all the harms from antibiotics. An x-ray is just a test. It's not a, it's not a diagnostic tool necessarily. It's more of a management tool uh, for MSK, and it's kind of a totally different way of thinking about it for most of us in eMERGE. We think of the x-ray as making the diagnosis, and then we stop thinking. And I think it's a history and physical that needs to drive it, and we have to take a little weight off the, uh, off the x-ray. Well, I'll say I had the pleasure of talking for an hour and 15 minutes about evidence-based medicine with a brilliant Jewel Yaffe. And it's great that at the end of that talk, in an hour and 15 minutes, we did not mention statistics a single time. And so my take-home message for everybody who's trying to read papers to do something about evidence-based medicine is that evidence-based medicine isn't about statistics. Evidence-based medicine is easy. And in order to understand papers, you just have to ask some very simple common sense questions. Uh, You have to understand who's in the paper. You have to understand what happened to them in the trial. And you have to understand what happened to them at the end of the trial. But you don't need to know the p-value. And I think that was my big lesson for, for today. We just touched on a recent pain-related article that got a lot of play, and there was a bit of a discussion in the room. I think as a community, we're going to have to be very careful that we critically evaluate pain-related research as closely as we evaluate everything else, and keeping in mind that we all have an interest in preventing opiate abuse, I think we have a long way to go before we're going to be able to eliminate the use of opioids as a, an analgesic in the, in the emergency department. So we have to be careful that we don't get sucked into a pendulum effect. When you're suspecting something in the posterior circulation, especially in a young person, consider a painless uh, posterior circulation dissection. And rather than just getting a non-contrast CT head, go ahead and get the CTA because it can change management. You might end up sending them home on aspirin versus admitting them and waiting for an MRI. 
So my favorite pearl was finding out about, you know, doing pulse checks in the pseudo PEA and being able to figure out with an ultrasound that you can see a carotid pulse. Uh, and if you do have a carotid pulse, then you don't necessarily need to continue CPR and you can use that as your guide instead of trying to feeling for a pulse, which isn't always easy. And this is just a much easier way of doing it. So I think the biggest takeaway from today's session would have to be distinguishing what true PEA is from pseudo PEA. In cases where um, you have a patient who has PEA on the monitor and you're doing your pulse checks and you have your ultrasound on the, on the patient's heart and you see vigorous cardiac activity, that is a patient who would not benefit from more CPR. That is a patient who you should decide to stop CPR and decide to do other things that the patient may be benefit from. Things like starting the patient on an infusion of a, of a presser like norepinephrine and looking for other causes such as PE, like we saw in this case today where a PE was causing uh, vigorous cardiac activity, but we saw right heart strain in a patient we couldn't feel for pulses. So distinguishing between true PEA where the patient has no cardiac activity and no peripheral pulses as you can see on ultrasound versus pseudo PEA where there is cardiac activity and you can see a pulsatile pulse on the ultrasound sound machine, but you just can't feel it. Think about looking for reversible causes and think about stopping CPR and doing other things that'll be more beneficial than CPR in these patients. So I'm here with Irene today. Um, she's one of our vets to the emergency medicine cases course. Irene, what made you come back this year and uh, what's something that you're going to take away from the sessions that you're attending today? Well, I had a great time when I was here last year and uh, I had the best save of my career that came a week or two later, which I highly credit to taking the course where I, I was able to quickly respond to an arrest case that was as a result of PE and that patient ended up having a great survival because of the uh, ultrasound aspects that I learned while on course last year. So of course I had to return this year. And the highlight, of course, was uh, Anton Hellman getting NP scoped. Um, we just saw how easy that is and so painless, or Anton's just so tough. Actually, I'm a huge wimp. It was really Dr. Sommer's incredible skill that made it painless. Now, onto what you've all been waiting for, a live podcast from the EM Cases Course 2018 with Anna McDonald on ocular trauma. We're about to do what's only been done a handful of times in emergency medicine. This will not be a lecture. This isn't even a regular EM Cases podcast. This is the fourth ever live EM Cases podcast where you'll get a little bit of the behind the scenes sneak peek at how we record a podcast, but this time with audience participation. We'll be putting the questions out there to you, the audience, along the way. So what do you say, Dr. McDonald? Should we cue the music? Hit it, Dr. Hellman. Welcome to the Emergency Medicine Cases Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anton Hellman, bringing you Canada's brightest minds in emergency medicine live from the EM Cases course in Toronto. On this special live episode, we have Dr. Anna McDonald, master clinician from North York General and St. Michael's Hospitals, probably the most adored ED physician amongst colleagues I've ever worked with. Dr. McDonald, welcome to EM Cases. I totally paid him to say that. <laughs> All right, so I love a challenging airway and managing cardiac arrest and massive GI bleed, and I feel pretty comfortable doing those things, but I don't know about you, but what scares the bejesus out of me is this, blunt ocular trauma. So it should, Dr. Allen. And I'm hoping by the end of this session that although we're going to maintain a healthy respect for this, that we will also be a little more confident when we see our next patient with a smashed eye. Yeah, so with that in mind, we're going to cover a few things. The first take-home point, and really the biggest take-home point, uh, which is what I love about, about this whole thing, this is, we're not going to be talking about rocket science or the sexiest, newest thing or some meta, meta uh, way of thinking about things. It's really all about the physical exam. So physical exam is queen. And we'll also hit on the nuances of three critical diagnoses that you have to make and, and consider in every patient who gets punched in the eye. So here we go. Let's go.
A 65-year-old man on Rivaroxaban for AFib comes in having had a syncopal episode in their bathroom at home. His only complaint is left eye pain. On exam, he's alert and he's oriented. He's got normal vitals and no other obvious injuries. His left eye is swollen shut with a big, nasty bruise. So I'll just put it out there to the audience now. What are you worried about in this patient? Retrobulbar hematoma, okay, anything else? Basler skull fracture, good. Hyphema, orbital fracture, globe rupture, orbital fracture, great, you guys are awesome. You know, in general in emergency medicine, we're trained to rule out the worst things first. You know, and we're really good at assessing patients with chest pain and, you know, forcing ourselves to think about dissection and PE. But for whatever reason, when it comes to ocular trauma, we seem to concentrate, I don't know why, but we seem to concentrate on orbital fractures. For some reason, that, that's where our mind goes. But really, we should be thinking first and foremost about the vision-threatening stuff. Orbital compartment syndrome, globe rupture, retinal detachment, and hyphema. Yeah, and given all of these concerns, um, the best way to proceed with a patient like this is to do a really thorough, thorough physical exam. You know, we talk in emergency medicine all the time about the sensitivity and specificity of this test and that test. We talk about, you know, the role of imaging and all of this kind of stuff. But this is the presentation where it really hangs on the physical exam. Um, So we got to go back, way back to our old ways and our old skills. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of really any other presentation that's really, again, all about the physical. Yeah, it's real old school medicine. All right, so in our systematic approach to the physical exam of the ocular trauma patient, we really need to cover everything from visual acuity to intraocular pressure. And I usually don't like just rhyming off lists, but this is so important that you actually go through all of these things, because ultimately, the most common reason we miss these diagnoses is just not being thorough in our physical exam. So the sixth vital sign is the visual acuity, right? So any patient with any eye complaint, they all need a visual acuity. That should be done at triage by the nurse before you even see the patient. Then obviously you want to get a really good look at the eye, so inspect the eye really well. And then you're going to want to take a good look at the pupils as well, obviously to see if there's any irregularity in the pupils, but also look for reactivity and specifically looking for an RAPD. Yeah. Who who here finds RAPD kind of tricky sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, I find it tricky too. So next in the things that you have to do for all your eye patients is you need to check visual fields and extraocular movements. And again, this is, that's not the first thing you're thinking about when you have a patient with an eye trauma are those two things. But again, they're really important to pick up retinal detachment, for example, because you can't get a traumatic retinal detachment. Sure. And then if it's possible, it's great to get the patient sitting up at a slit lamp to get a really good look at their eye. Now, that's not always possible, depending on the other things that are going on with the patient. But if you can, it's a really important piece of the physical exam here. All right. And finally, the intraocular pressure. So, of course, if you suspect a globe rupture, this is why we have the plus minus sign up there. If you suspect a globe rupture, you don't want to be doing an IOP. But in all the other trauma patients, you do want to be doing an IOP, and it'll become clear why we do that soon. Now, the three physical exam moves that are most commonly overlooked leading to misdiagnoses are the RAPD, the visual fields, and the IOP. Yeah, and you'll see kind of how these three things are really important as we go through the cases. All right, let's talk about some of the nuances of the physical exam then. So going back to our 65-year-old patient, his lid swollen shut, the first challenge is always, how do you actually go about examining eye, the eye when the lid is all swollen shut? 
Yeah, it can be really tricky, obviously. I am surprised, however, constantly surprised, at no matter how much swelling there is, I can often get a reasonable look at the eye if I really try. So often I'll get a little bit of gauze just in both my fingertips, and I'm just going to gently pull those eyelids apart from one another, making sure, obviously, that I'm pulling up and down as opposed to putting pressure backwards against the globe, because this is potential globe rupture behind there. Sometimes, and very rarely, but sometimes I'm unable to get a good look at the eye um, because of all of the swelling. And if that's the case, I do often drag up my bedside ultrasound and take a look. All right. Well, we just happen to have two Toronto ultrasound gurus here at the course uh, as faculty, Rob Samard and Jordan Chenkin. Come on up here, guys. I'm going to give you guys two minutes to tell us the most interesting pearl-packed things we need to know about POCUS for ocular trauma. I don't think Rob's capable of talking for just two minutes, so just be careful. Talks from experience. Well, thank you, Anton and Anna. You know, it's interesting. They just said, you know, plus or minus intraocular pressures, and now we're talking about placing an ultrasound probe right over the eyeball. Kind of sounds like a contraindication right there. So before we even get started on some of the pearls of the ultrasound, I want to give just a word of warning when using ultrasound if there's any chance that there's a globe rupture. So the technique that you want to use if you're going to use ultrasound in a traumatic eye like this is you want to ensure that there is plenty of gel placed over the eye so that the ultrasound probe doesn't actually touch the eyelid. Instead, it floats on top of the gel, on top of the eyelid, such so using the gel is what it's designed to do, which is to be a step off between the skin of the eyelid and your probe, so you're not actually adding any pressure to the eyeball to potentially worsen a globe rupture. So ideally what you would do is you would lie the patient down on a stretcher, a tegaderm over the eye if need be, and then you're going to put plenty of gel over top of the eye, and then you're going to place the probe on the gel in order to obtain your image. And I would just emphasize the, the tegaderm part. Uh, we often forget about the cleanup process when we do this scan. Um, but how are you going to get that gel, all that gel that you put on there off the eye after? You don't want to be using a towel to be pushing on the globe after. So uh, this is one situation where I always use a tegaderm because then you can just easily peel the tegaderm off. All the gel comes off with it. You don't have to worry about the, the cleanup process afterwards. So now once you've placed the probe on, your, on the eyeball or floating on the gel above the eyeball, you can now look at a few things that can help us. Jordan, do you want to take us a few, some of the things that you would look for in the traumatic eye? Yeah, so luckily um, eye ultrasound is, is super easy to do. I mean, you're, you're looking at a big black round circle with another little black circle at the top, which is the anterior chamber. And so even if you've never done ocular ultrasound before, um, it's really easy just to have a look at the, the eye and you're looking for major disruptions, especially in trauma. So you're looking to see, is that little black circle at the top, the anterior chamber, is it there or not? Um, and so sometimes that could be a clue to an anterior chamber perforation. Uh, you're looking to see, is the vitreous intact? So do you have that big black circle that looks nice and round um, all the way at the back? And in a globe rupture, what you're going to see, it's going to be immediately obvious that you have the sclera all buckling in. The black space, the anechoic space that normally lives in the, in the back of the eye is all full of echogenic stuff, which is blood and clot. Um, and it's really obvious that this doesn't look normal. Um, so ex excellent question. So the question is, uh, what probe should we be using? And we're always going to be using the high-frequency linear array probe for this because it's a very um, superficial structure, and you want as high resolution as possible. So you're going to use the linear probe. Um, towards the back of the eye, you can look for traumatic retinal detachments. Again, really obvious. You have an extra bright white line in the middle of the black circle that shouldn't be there. And then finally, you can look for signs of retrobulbar hematomas because what happens when you have a retrobulbar hematoma is it compresses the globe. So it's no longer a circular shape. It starts to uh, have uh, irregular appearance to it. Some people have referred to it as a bit of a, uh, what they call a guitar pick sign. It starts to look actually like a guitar pick where it's pointed at the bottom and round at the top. Um, so these are things that are going to just jump off the screen at you. And the nice thing is that uh, most of your patients should have an other eye to compare to. Um, so if you're not sure if what you're looking at is normal or not, just have a scan the, scan the unaffected eye and uh, you can quickly compare. And I got to say, <laughs> one of the absolute coolest things that ultrasound has a utility for is in the picture that we have up here, when that eye is completely swollen shut, we mentioned that you want to do a physical exam, check to see if there's an RAPD, 
things like that. When the eyes swollen shut, you're trying to pry it open and you can't pry it open. One of the cool things you can do is you can place the ultrasound probe on the, patient, on the, on the gel over the patient's eye, find the pupil of the patient, shine light in the non-affected eye, and you can actually see on ultrasound the pupil constrict or not. You can also shine light through the eyelid of the eye and watch to see if the pupil can constrict or not. So you can actually do your pupillary assessment with ultrasound without even having the patient's eye open. That's a fun trick to impress your medical student if you have one working with you. Great. Thanks so much, guys. Some great pearls there. All right. So we've got some more pearls coming here. Uh, This one I like to call the McDonald symmetry trick. So, you know, sometimes it's really hard to assess whether someone has proptosis or if they have a globe rupture and then they have endophthalmus, which is their eye sunken in, right? Um, sometimes it's very obvious, but really we want to be picking up those subtle globe ruptures, those subtle retrobarbal hematomas. So Dr. McDonald, how do you suggest we look for symmetry in the eye? So I'm not exactly sure that I can take credit for this because I'm pretty sure that this is a relatively standard way of looking for proptosis or enophthalmos. Um, But yeah, as you said, it's very difficult to tell if someone has subtle proptosis or enophthalmos just by looking at them straight on. So if they're lying in a bed, I'll actually get all the way up to the head of the bed and I'm going to crouch down at the head of that bed and I'm going to look at those globes. I may have to retract the eyelid a little bit in order to see the front of the globes. But I'm just going to be comparing one side to the other to see if one is sitting proud of the face or if one is sitting a little bit sunken. Um, If they're in a chair uh, in your examination room, in your eye room, you can recline that chair and you can either go from the head of the bed or you could get a worm's eye view as well from the the bottom looking up towards the patient's face. But basically you just want to see those eyes in profile so that you can compare the anterior part of the globe on one side to the other. All right. So getting back to the case again, we've got our 65-year-old man. His visual acuity is moderately bad at 20 over 100. Uh, His pupils are round, but they're unequal. You don't see any uvule prolapse. He has limited extraocular movements, particularly on upward gaze. And his intraocular pressure in the left eye is a whopping 50. And by the end of your exam, you're thinking maybe you notice some proptosis using the McDonald symmetry trick. (laughs) All right. So audience, at this point, what's your diagnosis? Retrobulbar hematoma. All right, anything else? So this is probably a retrobulbar hematoma. Why do we worry about a retrobulbar hematoma? Orbital compartment syndrome. Exactly. So we've got a retrobulbar hematoma with an orbital compartment syndrome. Now the next question is, Dr. McDonald, would you do a stat CT scan on this patient at this point? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, to me, an orbital compartment syndrome in the right clinical context, this is a clinical diagnosis. This is not a diagnosis that requires any imaging. Now, is the imaging helpful? Yes, it certainly can clinch your diagnosis. Sometimes the consultants want that imaging, particularly because they want to look for other injuries. For example, an orbital fracture, orbital floor fracture, they may want to know about that ahead of time. But I certainly wouldn't be delaying management of this patient, particularly the patient that you're describing to me now. I wouldn't be delaying the management of this patient for a CT. Now, it does take time, obviously, to set up the process to manage this patient and to potentially call your consultant and things like that. So if you have availability of STAT CT and you can get them to and from CT in a few minutes um, and it's not going to delay your management, then by all means, it is a helpful test. Um, But I would not be allowing CT to be delaying my management of this patient. All right. Assuming that CT would delay your management, what would you do at this point for the patient? Yes, a lateral canthotomy. This patient requires a lateral canthotomy. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about why you need to do a lateral canthotomy. Mm -hmm. I'm a very systematic thinker. I don't like memorizing lists. So to me, I like to split up the features that I'm expecting to see in orbital compartment syndrome into two categories, into what I call the mechanical features and what I call the ischemic features. Those mechanical features are usually going to be the ones that are going to start first. So you get a bleed behind the eye. That bleed is going to expand, is going to push that eye forward. So you're going to get some proptosis. As it pushes that eye forward, the pressure in the eye is going to go up. So you're going to have an increase in your intraocular pressures. 
also that bleed pushing the eye forward is going to stretch those extraocular muscles and are going to, is going to make some limitation of extraocular movement. And then as that process continues, as the pressure goes up, you're actually going to cut off circulation to the anterior portion of the optic nerve. So you're going to end up with what I call the ischemic features of an orbital compartment syndrome. So these are things like a decreasing visual acuity in that eye, as well as pupillary changes. And it may start as subtle as an RAPD on that side. And eventually, if allowed to progress, you will end up with a fully blown pupil on that side as well. All right, so I think that's a great way of looking at things. Mechanical, ischemic, mechanical is your proptosis. The extraocular movements are going to be affected. And then the ischemic, it's really that optic nerve. Uh, when your optic nerve starts to go, that's when, they're, when they really get into trouble. So this patient definitely needs a lateral canthotomy. For sure. Dr. McDonald, what is the biggest clinical pitfall when it comes to lateral canthotomies? I mean, I think a little bit about lateral canthotomy the same way that I think about surgical crike. I think that the biggest pitfall there is just not doing it, not getting out your knife uh, in the case of surgical crike and not getting out your scissors in the case of a lateral canthotomy. Um, they're both, you know, technically not very complex procedures, but it's a little scary, right? Because how often do we actually put our scissors and cut things that are that close to someone's eye? So I think the biggest pitfall here would be, you know, you've made the diagnosis, you know that's what the patient needs and then just failing to do that lateral canthotomy. So be a Nike ninja and just do it. I mean, the, the one lateral canthotomy that I've, I've done before um, had a horrible bloody field. And that's, I think, something that scares away people from doing these as well. Similar to a crike again, they're usually really bloody. And then you can't see anything. And then your, you know, your anxiety level goes up because you can't see anything. Um, and it's, it's similar with this, that you'll, you should expect to have a bloody field. Let's watch a, a video on lateral canthotomy. It's a short video, and I just need to credit my friend and co-podcaster, uh, Jess Mason, for this video uh, and MRAP of this lateral canthotomy. So here we go. First step is you want to get it numbed up. So lidocaine with epi, be a nice doctor. Second, you're going to crush the lateral canthus with a clamp. This devascularizes the area. Now, here it is in the real procedure. You want to leave that clamp there for about one minute so it doesn't bleed like stink when you cut. And that's coming up in step three. Cut the lateral canthus. You're going to cut towards the orbital rim on the side. Next, you're going to cut that lateral canthal ligament, which has both a superior and inferior cruce. Sort of looks like a wishbone on its side. You want to cut down, cut that inferior cruce first. Sometimes this releases enough pressure on its own, but if not, cut the superior cruce. Now, it can be real hard to see, even for you, not just the patient. There's a lot of blood, oozy stuff. So get in there with one of your instruments, get some tactile feedback. It sort of feels like a guitar string. The lateral canthal ligaments are not as superficial as you might think. So, and the tissues there are all really tight. You can imagine if you do it on your eye right now, there's a lot of laxity there. But in these particular patients that have that big bleed behind their eye and their eye has been squished forward, it's actually those tissues are really, really tight. Um, and so that it's, it can be difficult to get in there and to really feel the lateral canthal ligaments. But it's really tactile, like it's very much a tactile procedure. And you do feel those lateral canthal ligaments. You can kind of flick them a little bit with the tip of your scissors and you can feel when you hit it and then you can feel when you divide you actually feel those tissues give way yeah i like that analogy of if you have to feel like you're feeling a guitar string if anyone's a musician or a violinist you know what it feels like to to hit that guitar string and it's taut that's what it feels like and it does it does feel like that and once you divide as she mentioned in the in the video once you divide the inferior lateral canthal ligament that's usually what you go for first you want to make sure that that procedure has actually been successful so if it has been successful you should see the intraocular pressure go down so i have the tonal pen at the bedside and i recheck that pressure and also you actually do see those tissues kind of give way and you almost get that feeling that you oh yeah i've have re relieved some pressure here if you've been successful and if you don't get that relief and you don't get that decrease in the IOP after dividing the inferior portion of the canthal ligament, you're then going to divide the um, superior portion of the lateral canthal ligament. All right. So in this case, you perform your lateral canthotomy. And then just like Dr. McDonald said, you need to recheck the intraocular pressure. And in this case, his intraocular pressure went from 50 down to 20.
All right. Now, of course, timing is key when it comes to lateral canthotomy. I think a little bit about this procedure um, in the same way that I think about, you know, treating a STEMI. So uh, um, in a STEMI, we talk about time as myocardium, right? You want to get that balloon to that culprit vessel as fast as you can to save the myocardium. And the same applies here, but here time is vision or time is eye. You want to decompress that orbit as quickly as possible. There's no good RCT evidence, obviously, as to when this needs to be done. There's some thought in some of the literature that after the onset of ischemic symptoms, and again, this can be as subtle as a very slight loss of your visual acuity or a very subtle RAPD, this procedure should be done within 60 to 120 minutes. So you really, you have a, a pretty tight um, uh, timeline here. Right. So, you know, if your patient's presenting at three in the morning uh, and your ophthalmologist is fast asleep, then you're going to be the one doing this procedure. Mm -hmm. And actually, I had an experience because one of the ones I did was at this hospital and the ophthalmologist who happened to be on call at that time was not comfortable doing this procedure. So you may run into that at your hospital as well. And you, in fact, may be the doctor who is best set up to do this procedure, depending on where you work. So we've done the lateral canthotomy. We've done the surgical part. What about the medical part? his IOP has decreased. Uh, what else are you going to do for this patient? Yeah, so you're going to go after the IOP in the same way that you would be treating an acute angle closure glaucoma. So, you know, making sure the head of the bed is up. Obviously, if you're not concerned about a spinal injury or something like that where you can't do that, um, although you could always tilt the bed. Um, you want to give some mannitol, some acetazolamide, and obviously you want to be treating the patient's symptoms as well, making sure they have good analgesia and antiemetics because it's quite a stimulation. Uh, it's quite a painful uh, diagnosis to have. Um, you can use some timolol drops as well. Again, none of these things have really been studied in isolation, but this is the recommendation generally from our, our ophthalmology and oculoplastics colleagues. And then the other thing that's important to recognize here is that the lateral canthotomy is not the definitive management of this patient. This patient still needs to go to the operating room with an oculoplastic surgeon or with an ophthalmologist who's able to, to manage the procedure and actually do a formal procedure to evacuate that retrobulbar hematoma and then deal with whatever orbital fractures may be associated with this injury as well. But but what you've done is you've temporized the situation, you have saved this patient's vision, and you've allowed some more time to get the definitive management for this patient. All right. So yeah, while you're setting up for your lateral canthotomy, you can give all these uh, medications, the mannitol, the acetazolamide, et cetera. And of course, you're going to want to think about reversing the rivaroxaban, right? Which we've covered in detail on other podcasts with Dr. Himmel. But when it comes to bleeding, it seems that TXA is sort of the drug of the times. Would you give TXA in this case? I think in the case that you've described to me here, where it's pretty profound uh, ischemic symptoms that this patient's beginning to develop, and the patient's on rivaroxaban, which is not readily reversible, I would certainly give TXA in this particular patient. There hasn't been good randomized control trial evidence for TXA in this specific diagnosis. But again, I think it's very reasonable, particularly in the patient that has a propensity to bleed. All right, so let's review orbital compartment syndrome. Number one. So think about the mechanical and the ischemic features of orbital compartment syndrome. Number two. Orbital compartment syndrome is a clinical diagnosis. You should be calling the surgeon, setting up for a lateral canthotomy, giving your meds to decrease the IOP. Another way of saying this is don't let the imaging delay your consult or your cantholysis. Number three. Stay calm and just do a lateral canthotomy. Be that Nike ninja. Case number two. An otherwise healthy 44-year-old man is playing badminton when he gets a shuttlecock directly into the left eye. He comes in complaining of pain, blurry vision, and nausea. You notice that he's diaphoretic. This guy doesn't look good. And as you bring the ophthalmoscope up to his eye, he vomits on your shoes. So audience, at this point, what is your differential diagnosis? Hyphema, good. Traumatic glaucoma, great. Anything else? Retinal detachment, great. All right, so as we've learned in the previous case, physical exam is queen. So Anna, uh, what did you find on physical exam in this patient? Yeah, so this gentleman looked very unwell. He was sitting in our eye room, just kind of repeatedly retching into a basin. Um, and when I did take a look at his eye, it was a little bit unusual. I couldn't quite see the pupil, um, or it looked a little bit obscured. I was able to see it enough to see that it was round and, and regular in appearance, um, and that it was somewhat reactive to light, although not as well as the other side. His visual acuity 
acuity had been documented by the nurse as zero in that eye, but actually when you examined him more closely, although he wasn't able to count fingers, he was able to perceive light and what direction the light was coming from. Um, so we didn't have no vision. The orbital rim itself looked completely normal. There was no step deformity or swelling. It was literally just that eye. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks, if you look really carefully at this image, it kind of looks like the iris is just, is a kind of reddish hue. But mm -hmm. if you don't look carefully, you could see how, you know, it could just look like a normal eye almost. Yeah, and it was pretty clear when you took a really close look that it was a hyphema that I was dealing with here. Hyphema, we're talking bleeding from the iris or the ciliary body. Now, sometimes these are very easy to see, you know, the classic layering of the blood, the, the classic meniscus that we see. But I find that sometimes they're actually quite subtle, um, and these are the ones that are easy to miss. One of the big pitfalls is to assume that the patient doesn't have a hyphema if you don't see that obvious meniscus. So, Dr. McDonald, what would be some tips that you could give our audience on how to detect those really subtle hyphemas where you don't see an obvious meniscus. Mm -hmm. So the key here is that you're going to need a slit lamp for this. And you want to be very confident in being able to look at the anterior chamber of the eye. Now, certainly I'm first going to go for that kind of inferior portion of the limbus um, with my slit lamp, because sometimes with a slit lamp, when it's magnified, you can see the beginnings of a meniscus forming down there, and that clinches your diagnosis. But if you're not able to see that, it's still possible there could be some red cells in the anterior chamber. So I do an anterior chamber exam in the same way that I would do an anterior chamber exam for a suspected iritis to look for cells and flare, essentially. Um, so what I do is I will narrow my beam down. I'll make sure the room is nice and dark, and I'm going to narrow my beam down. So I'm going to narrow the width, and I'm going to narrow the height of my beam. So I've almost got kind of a projector beam um, type thing going on. And then I'm going to angle the light off slightly so that I can see the light passing through the different structures. Passing through, on this case, looks like the light's coming from right to left. So here you can see the light initially passing through the cornea um, and then passing through the anterior chamber and then hitting the lens at the back. And what you're going to do is you're going to use the pupil like the backdrop for your anterior chamber. That should be black. You shouldn't see anything there at all. You should just see the square of light through the cornea and then the square of light as it hits the lens. You shouldn't see that anterior chamber. Um, if you do see it, you know, like as if your projector beam is in a dark room, um, that's called flare. And then those little dots that you see floating in there, those are cells. And in the right clinical context, so in the context of trauma, if you see cells and flare in the anterior chamber, that's concerning for a very subtle hyphema. All right. So we've talked a little bit about visual acuity. We've talked about the slit lamp exam. What at this point is missing from our physical exam? Pressure. IOP. Absolutely. So Dr. McDonald. What was the IOP in this patient, and, and why is it really so important? We're going to drive home why it's important to get the IOP. So in this patient, I did check his pressures. He had a pressure of 14 in the right eye, which was normal, and in the left eye, it was 55. Pretty high. Um, so it was clear that I was dealing with not just a hyphema, but also a traumatic acute glaucoma. So how does that work? Like, How, how do patients with a hyphema then go on to get an acute glaucoma. Mm. Um, so you go kind of way back to your eye anatomy that you learned in school, um, and you know how the aqueous humor flows through the eye. So it's produced in the ciliary body, sitting behind the iris, and then the aqueous humor flows anteriorly through the pupil into the anterior chamber, and then drains out through the, um, the edges uh, of the anterior chamber through the trabecular meshwork. As you can imagine, if there's bleeding into the anterior chamber, those, right blood, those red blood cells that are floating in there are going to continue to start draining through the trabecular meshwork, but may actually gum up the system. They can form some clots and can kind of block the trabecular meshwork, which don't allow any longer the aqueous humor to exit the eye, which causes an increased pressure in the eye. Now, there are other things that cause traumatic glaucoma. Traumatic glaucoma is a wider thing than, than the, gla the glaucoma that's due just to hyphema. The hyphema is only one mechanism. Certainly, if you dislocate your lens or you injure the iris in some way that it blocks the outflow of the aqueous, you're also going to get a glaucoma. Um, related to that. Yeah, so again, it drives home the importance of doing an IOP in these patients because there's all kinds of reasons why they could have uh, elevated pressure. So this patient will need glaucoma treatment. The, the treatment's relatively straightforward because it's the same kind of treatment that you'd give a patient, any patient with acute angle glaucoma. You give them timolol drops, you know, and uh, acetazolamide, pil pilocarpine, et cetera. Mm -hmm. 
There's only one caveat there, and that's when it comes to the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, so the acetazolamine that you're giving to these patients. Um, in patients who have sickle cell disease, um, it's really important that you avoid using acetazolamide. That's really a, a contraindication for uh, sickle cell patients because changing the pH of the blood actually increases their propensity to sickle. I think we hear a lot about sickle cell disease in terms of the risk for rebleed. Patients with sickle cell disease are at higher risk for rebleeding with their hyphemas than other patients, um, but it's also important just to remember that that little piece of the management is a bit different as well. Well, wow, that's that's a pro tip. I love that. All right, so just to remember that when you have a sickle cell patient with eye trauma, you you got to be worried and remind yourself that they shouldn't have acetazolamide. All right, so now you've got this patient with this huge hyphema and acute glaucoma. Besides decreasing the IOP with meds, what what else does this patient need? Yeah, so I think about three other categories of things that I'm going to need to do for this patient. Um, obviously, first of all, symptomatic management. This patient was really uncomfortable. He was in a lot of pain. He was particularly very nauseated. Um, so giving him some antiemetics and some analgesics is really important. The second piece of the management is just ensuring that you're allowing that blood to layer out to the inferior portion of the anterior chamber so it's not going to block the pupil, so it's not going to cause any increased corneal staining. Um, and in order to do that, you're going to make sure that the patient is sleeping upright so 45 degrees or above, even sleeping in a chair would be great until that blood has layered out. And then ensuring that they're limiting their extraocular movement. So no heavy physical activity and no reading, because you can imagine those saccades as you're reading is actually going to shake up the anterior chamber and cause that blood to shake up as well. So just trying to kind of rest as much as possible with the head upright to allow that blood to layer out. And then the third category of things that you want to make sure you do is trying to, as much as possible, prevent rebleeds, because it's been shown that rebleeding um, actually carries more morbidity as well and will cause issues with corneal staining and, and de decreased visual acuity in the long run. So you want to tell these patients to avoid using NSAIDs. If they are on uh, anticoagulants, you definitely want to have a think about potentially stopping those anticoagulants for a few days or potentially reversing them, depending on the clinical context here. We touched on TXA a little bit in the first case. You know, it kind of makes sense that if someone's bleeding in their eye and they've got acute glaucoma and their eye's about to explode, that you'd want to stop any further bleeding. There's pretty good evidence for TXA and everything from multi-trauma patients to epistaxis to menorrhagia. What does the literature say about, about TXA for hyphema? Mm. So some of the original literature looking at uh, antifibrinolytics in uh, hyphema looked at an old drug called aminocaproic acid, which we don't really use that much anymore. TXA, we're really comfortable with it as eMERGE docs. We use it, as you said, for lots of different indications. And there have been recent RCTs looking at TXA um, in hyphema patients. Um, there is reasonable evidence to show that it does decrease the rate of rebleed with hyphema. The particular study that I'm talking about here didn't unfortunately find a change in terms of visual visual acuity in the long run um, with TXA versus no TXA. However, the patient population that they used um, did not include any patients with sickle cell, did not include any patients on anticoagulation. So I suspect potentially had their rebleed rate been a little higher than it was with a higher risk population, they may have seen um, more consequences with that. But it does seem to decrease the rate of rebleeds, which, um, which is not a bad thing. All right. And for a hyphema, giving TXA, do you give it IV? Do you take the, uh, a bottle of the IV stuff and drop it in their eye? Do you give it PO? So again, that the one that the RCT that I'm discussing actually used POTXA in the same way that we would give for menorrhagia. So that's a bit about TXA. Let's say it's three in the morning and your ophthalmologist is fast asleep at home. Which patients with hyphema would require an immediate optho consult? Like you're getting your ophthalmologist out of bed. Yeah, so there's immediate and there's immediate, right? Definitely most of these patients can wait until the morning for you to call ophthalmology if that's what's done at your site. If they have really high intraocular pressures, and especially if you're having difficulty getting that IOP down with your medical management, this is something that I would, would wake my ophthalmologist up in the middle of the night to discuss. Um, and they do sometimes take these patients to the OR. They'll do this kind of fancy stuff. They'll actually pull the clot out of the anterior compartment. They might do a laser iridotomy in the same way they do for acute angle closure glaucoma. So there are surgical treatments um, for this if the medical management fails or if it's really severe, particularly with that sky high IOP. Mm -hmm. And what about patients who have like a huge eczema, like, you know, this guy where it's like a hundred percent 
Yeah, so that's the, the classic eight ball that you're talking about, yeah. the eight ball hyphema, with just basically a massive clot sitting in that interior chamber. Again, very reasonable to wake your ophthalmologist up for that. All right, so really big hyphemas. They're actually graded, but we don't need to know the grades, but suffice to say, really big ones would be uh, a reason to call your ophthalmologist right away to go for surgery. Uh, increased really high IOP uh, if they have sickle cell disease uh, and if their visual acuity is really poor. I think those would all be reasonable reasons to call your ophthalmologist in the middle of the night. Before we leave hyphemas, What if this patient's eye looked like this? So note that this patient has kind of a slightly irregular shaped pupil. So this could have just as easily been a globe rupture, uh, which should always be on our differential diagnosis of ocular trauma. So let's discuss a little bit about globe rupture. Dr. McDonald, what are the key clinical clues to recognizing globe rupture? So obviously the really obvious globe rupture, none of us are going to miss. Like if the eye is clearly exploded everywhere or is clearly anophthalmic and kind of sunken back into the face, none of us are going to miss that. It's the subtle globe ruptures that we really have to be tuned into to, to take a look for those subtle changes. And the key often is in the pupil. So as you said, kind of an irregular pupil. Now that's not like the classic teardrop pupil that you see with the uh, globe rupture, but certainly any kind of pupillary uh, irregular could point you towards a globe rupture. Also, if they have a kind of circumferential bullous edematous subconjunctival hemorrhage, that's concerning for globe rupture as well. And in fact, this again, I don't think is one that any of us are going to miss because it looks like that globe is also quite enophthalmic and sunken back into the eye. Um, so that's not going to be subtle. All right. Yeah. Again, you know, sometimes the enophthalmos or the sunken eye is quite subtle. So if you use your McDonald's symmetry trick and look from the head of the bed, uh, you'll be more likely to pick that up. The other thing that we need to look out for is a uveal prolapse. So who here has seen a uveal prolapse before? Yeah. So essentially you see like this little brown blob there out of the sclera, right? Mm Mm-hmm. It looks pretty weird, actually. And it's basically the uveal contents that have just protruded through the front of the eye there. Um, And then finally, you've got your decreased IOP. If you make the mistake of actually checking the IOP, oops, you know, don't check the IOP. And then you see a low IOP and then go, oh, it looks like my uh, tonometer isn't working very well. I think I'll try harder. (laughs) Because, of course you'll be squishing out the contents of your eye. Not a great thing. No. So let's review in any blunt ocular trauma to think about globe rupture and look for the clues. So here are the clues. It's the monstrous subconjunctival hemorrhage, the sunken in eye or an ophthalmos, uh, which you can see best from the head of the bed, a brown thing sticking out of the sclera, that's the uveal prolapse, and Finally, a funny-looking pupillary shape. Classically, it's the teardrop appearance, but again, you don't always have to get that teardrop appearance. It can be a pretty subtle, irregular pupil. Now, what about CT for globe rupture? Uh, What does the literature tell us about CT for globe rupture? We already talked about how CT shouldn't delay uh, you doing a lateral canthotomy in a patient with orbital compartment syndrome. What, What about for globe rupture? Yeah, so I have had um, consultant ophthalmologists ask me for CTs when I've been concerned about a globe rupture and trying to refer them a potential globe rupture. There is a paper that was published in Academic Emergency Medicine in September of last year that looked at the sensitivity and specificity of CT for globe rupture in blunt ocular trauma. And um, the specificity is very good. So I think it was about 97% or, or higher was the specificity for CT for globe rupture. But interestingly enough, the sensitivity sensitivity was actually not that good and was really variable depending on who was reading the scan as well. They quote numbers anywhere between kind of 55 and and 75 percent was the sensitivity of CT for globe rupture. And in terms of their gold standard, they were talking about like a proper exam by an ophthalmologist. So really a physical exam is actually picks up more globe ruptures than a CT. So don't be lulled into a false sense of security. If your radiologist doesn't think there's a globe rupture on CT, it's still possible. So keep your index of suspicion high. That's a bit about CT, that the sensitivity is poor. So uh, if you don't see it on CT, it's really, again, physical exam, which is queen. 
Now, luckily for globe rupture, the treatment in the emergency department is really quite straightforward, right? It's just a shield, call ophthalmology. Yeah, fair enough. And, you know, obviously you want to think about tetanus status and you want to give antibiotics to prevent endophthalmitis and all these other things as well. But yes, it's generally quite straightforward. Put a shield on the eye. Now, this is one where you actually do want to have an eye shield and not an eye patch. So if you don't happen to have one of those nice little eye shields that can go over the eye and not touch the eye, it's not a great idea to be kind of stacking gauze like you would patch an eye closed. Instead, I like this trick where you can just take a paper cup or a styrofoam cup, whatever you have in your department, just cut out the bottom of it so it's kind of small, smaller cup or a more shallow cup, and you could just tape that over the eye as an eye shield, kind of a quick and dirty eye shield. Can I call this one the McDonald eye shield trick? Oh dear. No? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't originate this I did, one? I did, did definitely did not invent this. Oh, darn, either. darn. No. That's a good, good trick though. All right, time for the take-home points. First, it's all in the physical exam old school style. Recognition of these uh, eye-threatening emergencies really is all about the physical. Yeah, and don't forget the RAPD, don't forget the IOP, and don't forget to check those visual fields. When it comes to orbital compartment syndrome, be a Nike ninja and just do the lateral canthotomy. Orbital compartment syndrome, traumatic glaucoma, and globe rupture are clinical diagnoses. Don't depend on the CT for those, and don't let the CT delay your definitive management. Yeah, call your ophthalmologist before the CT is there and be prepared to manage your patient. And just because you don't see a meniscus doesn't mean there's no hyphema. And think about using TXA uh, in patients who are bleeding in or around the eye, particularly with retrobulbar hemorrhage and with hyphema. And if you're faced with a patient whose eye is swollen shut, you can usually very gently open their eye. If you're having trouble, go for POCUS. Well, I don't know about you, but I certainly feel more comfortable with eye trauma now that we've podcasted on it. We hope you do too. So until next time, physical exam is queen, and don't wimp out on the lateral canthotomy when you know it's indicated. And as an added bonus, here's an excerpt from the expert panel that we did at the end of the day at the EM Cases course with the Walking Encyclopedia of Emergency Medicine, Dr. Walter Himmel. I just love this. Oh, and if you enjoyed the live podcast, I'll be recording another live podcast at EMU, Emergency Medicine Update Conference, at the end of April on Airway Pitfalls at Kill with the one and only Dr. Scott Weingart. The conference isn't sold out yet, so grab your ticket at emupdate.ca now. And here's Dr. Himmel. Tips for dealing with obstructive consultants. First of all, do your homework, which means you've got to do a very detailed, complete assessment, and you've got to have a pretty good idea what you're dealing with in terms of the patient, why they've got to be admitted and why they've got to be seen. Consultants who are obstructive particularly don't like someone who says, I have no idea what's wrong with this person, but they can't go home. You've got to do your homework, which means examine the patient and do a proper history, step number one. Step number two be a diplomat at all times. You've got to have a way of approaching a consultant. And here's what I say. Thanks for calling. I appreciate you calling me back. I need your help with somebody. That's my line every time. I love that. I need your help. It's really hard for people to be obstructive when you you say, I need your help. They give me a hard time and refuse. Here's exactly what I do. I pause for 15 to 20 seconds and don't (laughs) say a word. (laughs) Make sure the referral is no longer than about 15 to 18 seconds. I've got an 18-year-old person with severe whatever who's unable to go home because I'm concerned about their diagnosis, their pain, or their ability to manage the condition they have, period. I also use a broken record technique. I just repeat the same thing in the same way, in the same tone, after a 20-second break, I don't waver from that. After four or five times, here's my next question I say. What would you do if you were in my situation? Uh, I've, I've never had a problem with that. If you do all that, polite, pleasant, don't change your tone. You wait for 20 seconds when you get hit over the head. Do not make it personal. Do not feel attacked. Don't comment on their behavior, their attitude, or anything like that. 
Just talk about the patient. I truly need your help. And if you want to know another line that's hard for anybody to think about, I don't feel comfortable sending them home. I keep it simple. At all times, I absolutely stay away from personal arguments, their attitude, my attitude, the system, or issues like that. I stay out of that. That gets things into a different topic right now rather than the patient's issues and so forth. So I apologize. I thank them. I appreciate their help. I really need your help. I really need your help. I would deeply appreciate it. If you say the same thing respectfully three, four, or five times, eventually what are they going to say? This guy is so stupid. He's saying the same thing. <laughs> Fine, I'll see your patient already. But you start attacking them and getting defensive. Now you've entered a whole different world of debate. I've never, ever, ever had a problem. I can honestly tell you that. And of course, be ready. You know who your tough consultants are? Take a big breath and smile. The last thing I do if I'm on the phone, I sit up with my shoulders back. It's very hard to get down when you're sitting up with your shoulders up. It's almost impossible. Along with the release of this podcast, we've got a new Rapid Reviews video as well as a new Waiting to be Seen blog. So check those out at emcases.com. Thanks for listening. To lay me down Once more To lay Spot.